Hi, you're watching Teen Kids News. I'm Luke. We're all very excited to be part of a very special anniversary. This is our 20th season on the air. More on that later in the program. But now, let's go to our top story. By now, most of us know about the importance of recycling, and yet many of us are still confused about exactly what to recycle. As we're about to learn, putting the wrong waste into the recycle bin may be more than just a waste of time. It can actually be harmful. To recycle or not to recycle? That is the question. And it's a rather confusing question. As a result, Americans are often putting the wrong items into their recycling bins, or they're just not bothering to recycle. Either way, we're falling far short. Let me do the math for you. We Americans use about 46 million tons of plastic a year. I know, that's a hard number to wrap your head around. So look at it this way. The Empire State Building weighs about 365,000 tons. To equal that 46 million tons of plastic we use each year, you'd need the combined weight of 126 Empire State Buildings. But here's the really bad news. Of all that 46 million tons of plastic, new research shows that we only recycle about 5%. That's equal to the weight of just six of those Empire State Buildings. Clearly, we're not doing a good job. Not recycling enough is a problem, but recycling the wrong items can be an even bigger problem. So let's get some advice from an expert. Todd Reese works at TerraCycle. They're a waste management company located in New Jersey. When it comes to recycling plastics, what's the biggest misconception? One of the biggest misconceptions with recycling plastic is that people see the recycling symbol and they think that that means that it's recyclable. But in reality, the arrow symbol that are on most plastics designates the resin type, which is the type of plastic, not necessarily that it can be recycled. That's really interesting. Depending on where you live, regulations vary on what can be recycled, but most communities will accept plastics marked with a one or a two, right? Correct. Most municipalities will accept number ones and number twos in their curbside recycling programs. Number one is PET, which are generally used for water bottles and soda bottles. Number two is HDPE, which is used for milk jugs, shampoo bottles, and detergent containers. In addition to one and two, the code number goes up to the number seven. What about plastics marked with the number three or higher? So generally you have to check with your local community for anything above a number one or a number two, because these are more specialized plastics which may or may not be accepted in curbside recycling. What about plastics that don't have numbers, like sandwich bags? Generally those types of plastics are not gonna be accepted in curbside recycling programs. However, there are programs out there through companies like TerraCycle that do accept flexible plastics, which can then be utilized and recycled in a different manner. So what happens if you put items in your recycle bin that are not acceptable in your town? So this can cause problems in the municipal recycling process. For instance, putting in shopping bags and things like that may clog up the machines. Another thing that causes problems is recycling items that haven't been properly cleaned. Why is that? So the residue material, food often, is what causes a lot of contamination in recycled materials. This is something that is an issue because those materials, since they're not clean, can't easily be processed and it may actually cause an entire load of recycled materials from a whole set of households to need to be disposed of. Items should be washed, let dry, uh, before they're put into your recycling bin. How big a problem is contamination? So basically about 20% or one in five objects recycled have some sort of contamination that could cause problems. Wow, that's a lot. So the lesson for everyone is, if you leave food in your recyclables, you're not only making your items unrecyclable, you can actually ruin all the things in the truck that have been properly washed and recycled. Correct. I'm sure that's going to come as a surprise to a lot of people who just throw unwashed items into the blue bin. Thanks for all the advice, Todd. No problem. In 2022, the Biden administration signed a major bill to improve America's infrastructure. This includes things like bridges, roads, our power and water systems, as well as funds to fight climate change, including money to improve recycling. Hopefully we won't waste time 
coming up with new and better ways to solve how we deal with waste, especially plastics. For Teen Kids News, I'm Ava. We've got lots more coming up on Teen Kids News, so keep watching. We'll be right back. We can all use some advice on how to do our best in school. So Kristen's back with another Make the Grade report. When it comes to good study habits, many of us are in the dark, especially with regards to proper lighting. Let's start with the right bulb. We're all familiar with the tried and true incandescent bulb. It gives good, even white light. But LEDs are becoming more popular. They last longer and use less energy. They also don't get as hot as halogens, nor do they contain mercury like CFL bulbs do. Whatever bulb you choose, you want one that's not so bright that it'll give you a headache and not so dim that it'll cause eye strain. Brightness is measured in lumens. The experts recommend a bulb that gives off about 1100 lumens. That's equivalent to a traditional 75 watt bulb. You can check out the lumens on the package. Next is the position of your light source. If you're using a desk lamp, don't put it alongside the hand you write with. Instead, put it on the opposite side. And be sure it doesn't cause glare on your computer screen. Now, if someone could come up with a light that could actually make us smarter, that would be a bright idea. I'm Kristen, here to help you make the grade. What's in the name? Okay, for the name of this company, let's play a game. I'll give you the dictionary definition, and you try to figure out the company's name. A short burst of inconsequential information. Any guesses? Here's another clue from the dictionary. Chirps from birds. If you said the name of the company is Twitter, you're right. That's the story the founder of Twitter, Jack Dorsey, gives in explaining how he came up with the name. He said he originally wanted to call the company Twitch, but decided against it. So he went to the dictionary to find a similar sounding word. And that's when he found the definitions for Twitter. But in the interest of full disclosure, I have to tell you this. While we found similar definitions in online dictionaries, we couldn't find those two exact quotes cited by Dorsey. Not that I would dream of arguing with the man who launched 500 million tweets a day. But if I were to argue, I'd need more than 280 characters. With what's in a name, I'm Veronique. If you're a new driver, there's a lot to keep in mind. That's why we're bringing you this driving tip from the National Road Safety Foundation. You always have to be careful when you drive. But during bad weather conditions, you have to be extra careful. The deadliest driving hazard is rain. It causes about 7,000 deaths a year. When driving in rain, always use your headlights and windshield wipers. And slow down. Snow and ice make roads slippery. Be sure to drive slower. And keep extra distance between you and the vehicle in front of you. Fog reduces visibility. Experts advise that you use your headlights on low beam. Not on high beam when driving in fog. Again, slow down. Keep extra distance. And watch for brake lights ahead of you. Wind can also be a problem. Keep both hands on the steering wheel for maximum control. And beware of driving alongside large vehicles like tractor trailers. Strong winds can unexpectedly push trucks into your lane. Remember, whatever the weather, you need the right skills to drive safe. The NRSF produces lots of helpful videos. To see more of them and for info on driving safety, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe to the National Road Safety Foundation. We'll be right back with more Teen Kids News. Sometimes, too much of a good thing is not a good thing. A case in point is when we try too hard to be perfect. Katerina tells us more. Leo Tolstoy, the man who wrote the book War and Peace, gave this warning more than a hundred years ago. If you look for perfection, you'll never be content. Sadly, too many of us feel we failed if we aren't perfect, and that pressure isn't good. So how do you know if you're letting the pursuit of perfection get the better of you? Let's ask someone who knows firsthand. She's the author of the book Addicted to Perfect. Vitaly Buford is also a life coach, so she's very used to giving advice. Hi. Hi, thanks for having me. What are some of the signs that someone is struggling with perfection? Yeah, some of the signs include 
If you find yourself um, setting really high or unrealistic expectations of yourself, that's a sign. If you find yourself putting off projects and having a hard time starting them, that's a sign. Other signs include feeling overwhelmed, anxiety, comparing yourself to other people. Interesting. You've written that there are two types of perfection. One is what you call slow perfection. What's that? Yeah, so slow perfectionism is the kind of perfectionism that keeps you stuck. So that is procrastination, when you put things off, put projects off, waiting to start or waiting for that perfect moment. When you have a hard time making decisions, that is slow perfectionism. When you are constantly comparing yourself to others, maybe in person or even on social media. Again, having a hard time making decisions. It's the kind of perfectionism where you just feel stuck. I think we all know someone like that. And the other type is what you call fast perfection. Can you explain that? Yes. Fast perfectionism is the other end of the spectrum of perfectionism. So it is the achieve, 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 work harder, work better. I have to have the perfect grades and have the perfect resume. So I need to join all the the clubs at school. I need to be in all the sports because I need to be perfect. It leads to burnout, this fear of failure. Also, it's characterized by approval seeking. If you're always trying to please people, that is a sign of fast perfectionism. Is it just one or the other? Or can we have some slow and some fast perfection issues? Yeah. So you can actually have both. So in some areas of your life, like maybe school, you might be slow and fast. So you may be slow in terms of You procrastinate or put things off because you want it to be perfect. And so you wait until the last minute. You may also be fast in school because you want to have that perfect resume. And so no clubs or no no sports, no accolades are enough. And you want more and more and more. In other areas of your life, you may just be slow or fast. So you can be one or the other and you can be both. What can we do to overcome these? The first step is just by becoming aware. So reviewing that list of symptoms, am I slow, am I fast, and am I both? And just becoming aware of it without judgment. Every area of my life personally, I was basically both. So if I find myself, you know, putting off projects and procrastinating a lot, I use the mantra, done is better than perfect to get into action. Good advice. I guess there are things we can all work on. Thanks for speaking with us, Vitaly. Yeah, thanks. There's a great saying to keep in mind. Nobody is perfect. Otherwise, pencils wouldn't have erasers. I don't know who said it, but it certainly puts things into perspective. Rather perfectly. For Teen Kids News, I'm Katerina. Still ahead, we look back. As part of our 20th anniversary of Teen Kids News, we'll stroll down memory lane with another of our former reporters. We'll be right back. News for teens, delivered by teens. That's the mission of Teen Kids News. And we've been doing that for 20 years now. Here's another one of our reporters who's contributed a lot to the program over the years. the information and ideas are not your own, you need to cite the source. Hi, my name is Emily. I started on Teen Kids News when I was in middle school as a reporter, and I stayed in that role until about high school. My favorite memory from working on Teen Kids News was absolutely when I got to interview Gabby Douglas. It was right after she won an Olympic gold medal for gymnastics. And I still remember that day really vividly. I went to New York City to the um, very large Nintendo store. And so I remember doing a little um, shot in front of all of the fans. And there were so many fans waiting to see Gabby Douglas. And then when I finally got to interview her, she was super nice. And I never thought that I would get to meet um, an Olympic athlete right after they won a gold medal. Um, So that was very exciting and very fun for me, and I'll always remember that. 
So I am a um, reporter at Bloomberg News. It's a, a business news publication, and I focus my reporting mostly on um, the financial markets and the economy. Giving back means more than just talk. As the saying goes, you have to walk the walk. Absolutely, my experience at Teen Kids News helped me get to where I am today. And everything I learned from Alan, the director at Teen Kids News, um, in terms of delivering lines, making them sound natural, um, not reading pieces of paper, but uh, just talking to the audience as you would if you were talking to a friend. Um, that's absolutely helped me in my role as a reporter today. So it's really difficult to manage delivering the lines while also looking composed on camera and saying something clear. I remember one time I was doing a story about um, a rock camp and there was super loud music. Like the old song says, rock and roll never forgets. And I don't think these kids will either. <laughs> For TKN, I'm Emily. Kids were playing their instruments, and so it was really difficult to deliver the lines on camera while... <laughs> <laughs> Benny! <laughs> she always, um, I'm really sorry, she always comes over like when there's noise. I'm gonna put her outside. I'm. Very sorry. And as you can see, my dog walking into the back of the shot is a perfect example of how anything can happen when you're doing uh, live TV and on-camera interviews. So Teen Kids News definitely taught me how to be composed when events like that happen. Absolutely, being on Teen Kids News was so much fun. I got to meet so many interesting people. And of course, I loved uh, being in front of the camera. That was a really great experience that I definitely would not have had if I weren't on Teen Kids News. And it was really fun, of course, to tell my friends to watch the show so that they could see me on TV. In my Reign in Spain report, I'll take you to one of the royal palaces from which the Spanish kings reigned, next on Teen Kids News. It's been a monastery, a hospital, a university, and even a palace for kings. Continuing her series, The Reign in Spain, Nicole takes us to one of the country's most popular tourist sites. This is El Escorial. Despite its many functions over the centuries, this massive complex still serves as a palace, as well as a monastery. That it looks more like a fortress than a residence for royals and monks is no accident. It was built to withstand the competing forces that were tearing at the seams of Christianity, the Protestant Reformation versus Catholicism. In the 1500s, the conquistadors were discovering not just new lands, but seemingly endless new wealth. Ships called galleons were filled with gold from the New World and then sailed to Spain. King Philip II used much of that wealth to battle against the growing popularity of Protestantism. He built El Escorial as a symbol of the power and might of his Catholic religion. And Philip didn't just pay for its construction, he helped design it. 40,000 books and manuscripts line the walls of the Royal Library, but it's the ceiling that most captures attention. Colorful frescoes glorify subjects like grammar, math, and science. Frescoes of a different nature cover the long walls of the Hall of Battles. They're a visual record of Spain's major military victories. Some parts of El Escorial are utterly eerie. These steps lead down to the Pantheon, which is basically a huge tomb. Perfectly matched caskets made of marble and bronze hold the decaying bones of Spanish kings from the past 500 years. 
this eight-sided chamber of the dead is both beautiful and creepy. Very creepy. If after visiting the royal tomb you find you need a bit of fresh air, you can explore the grounds outside. For centuries, these gardens have been tended by the friars living and praying at the monastery. Strangely, El Escorial wasn't built in the heart of Madrid, Spain's capital, but rather in a remote area outside the city, surrounded by forested hills. Part royal palace, part monastery, El Escorial is all fantastico. For Teen Kids News, I'm Nicole. Well, that wraps up our show for this week. But we'll be back with more Teen Kids News next week. See you then.